Hi, I'm Dr. Piers, and welcome to this video on how bacteria generate genetic variation. We all know that mutation is the bedrock of creating genetic variation in all organisms, including bacteria. And in fact, a regular rate of mutation is actually necessary for species to evolve and adapt to new environmental conditions. Now in eukaryotes, variation can also be generated by shuffling the genetic deck through the process of meiosis. Every time a cell undergoes meiosis to form a sperm or an egg, the process of independent assortment will generate over 8 million different possible gametes, at least that is in humans with uh, 23 chromosomes. If you then randomly fertilize any of those sperm with any one of those eggs, you now have over 7 trillion different possible genotypes for the new individual. And while that in and of itself is impressive, this does not even factor in the process of crossing over during prophase one, which would give rise to incalculable variation. So that's pretty mind boggling. But what about the humble bacteria? Sure, it can mutate with the best of them. And because the short generation time, they can actually accumulate mutations quite quickly compared to their eukaryotic cell counterparts. Well, it turns out they have just a few tricks up their proverbial membranes, so to speak. The first is transformation, which was first described by Griffiths back in 1928. This occurs when the cells die, when bacterial cells die and release fragmented DNA, which then can be taken up by other nearby cells. Now, once this DNA fragment enters the recipient cell, it lines up with the corresponding DNA sequence in the bacterial chromosome and homologous recombination, which is otherwise known as a double crossover event, replaces the chromosomal sequence with the newly received fragment of DNA. The old fragment is then, uh, is then broken down, okay? Uh, and this could give, could give the recipient bacteria a different phenotype if the incoming DNA is different, uh, it is either a different sequence or a different allele than the original recipient chromosome. So in this case, the recipient actually swapped out a non-functional LAC-Z gene for a functional one. Now, transformation is a bit like what happens when a wheat paper bag breaks, scattering your groceries all over the place. It could happen that another organism comes along and picks up one of those groceries and exchanges it for something in their bag, giving rise to a completely different combination of groceries. Okay, that analogy isn't perfect, but I hope you kind of get the point. Now, it is time to talk sex bacterial sex, and yes, that is a thing, and it is called conjugation. In order for this to happen, you need to have both a boy bacteria and a girl bacteria, and again, that is a real thing. Male bacteria are considered donors, while female bacteria are considered recipients. Both have the usual chromosome, but the difference is, is that males possess an extra piece of circular DNA called the fertility, or the F-plasmid. This contains a whole number of genes, um, and most of them are, surprise, surprise, involved in fertility, not the least of which are the genes that code for the construction of the sex pillus. Now, mating is initiated by the connection between the two cells uh, via the pillus. The donor cell then replicates one of the uh, strands of the F factor and sends it through the pillus and into the recipient cell where it recircularizes. And uh, once, once it does, the complementary strand is synthesized, forming a complete new F plasmid in the recipient. So conjugation ends when the two cells separate from each other. But you notice now that due to the presence of the F plasmid in both cells, they are both males. Which, of course, begs the question, why then aren't all bacteria males? Well, the simplified answer is that the F plasmid is not always faithfully replicated during binary fission and can be spontaneously lost. So now that we're given, uh, but the fact that we're talking about bacterial variation, you might be wondering how conjugation ties into this since let's face it, turning females into males is not exactly diversifying the population. The reason why this is important is because of a special kind of conjugation called HFR, or high frequency recombination conjugation. Now, that's quite a mouthful, but how does it work? 
To start with, sometimes the F plasmid gets integrated into the bacterial chromosome. So now, when the conjugation is initiated, the bacteria starts to replicate the F plasmid, but because it's integrated, the replication process also includes the portion of the bacterial chromosome that is adjacent to the F plasmid. Therefore, when the F plasmid is sent into the recipient cell, it is now dragging a large chunk of the chromosome along with it. But because the conjugation process doesn't last that long, only a small portion of the chromosome is actually transferred uh, in, into the recipient cell before the sex pillus bridge is broken. And now, in this case, just like in transformation, homologous recombination can take place between the incoming fragment and the recipient's chromosome, potentially generating a new phenotype. And because the entire F plasmid is not transferred this time, the recipient actually remains female. So the next mechanism involves bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria by injecting their DNA into the cytoplasm of, of that bacteria. Now once in there, the hostile takeover begins. And this involves the breaking down of the bacterial chromosome, the replication of the viral genome, the production of new viral proteins by the host's cellular machinery, and the assembly of new viral particles. And finally, the bursting of the bacteria to release the new viruses. Now that's pretty devastating from a bacterial standpoint, but occasionally the virus mistakenly packages a piece of bacterial DNA into the phage head. And when this virus infects another bacteria, it no longer carries the instructions to make a new viral, uh, new viral particle. And instead, the incoming DNA, as you, as, as, as you can guess, can be inserted into the bacterial genome as described before and thus generating genetic variation. This is a little like an inept thief who breaks into a home, puts down his weapon and steals a big screen plasma TV, burning down the house on his way out. And then as he makes his way down the street, he decides, eh, you know what, I think I'm going to rob another house. But upon entering that one, he realizes he doesn't have his weapon, so he panics and drops the TV gently and flees as fast as he can. The owner of the house comes down to find the big screen TV and happily replaces, it, uh, replaces the old one with it, giving him a totally different viewing experience. Okay, that's a bit of a stretch and full of analogy plot holes, but I hope that makes a wee bit of sense for you. Finally, You've heard about jumping jacks, you've heard about jumping rope, and perhaps you've even heard about jumping spiders. But jumping genes? Absolutely, those are a thing, and they're commonly known as transposons, and while they're a little bit bizarre, they are a lot more common than you would think. They were first described in the early 50s by Barbara McClintock, who was way ahead of her time. She was awarded the Nobel Prize for her work 30 years after it was initially published, presumably when a bunch of men caught up with her understanding of these elements, but I digress. She was working with Indian corn, which comes in a beautiful array of colors, and she noticed that while most kernels were completely colorless or colored, some of the kernels had a mottled appearance. And she was able to eventually demonstrate that this was due to a piece of DNA that was able to jump in and out of the gene that coded for kernel color. So how does that exactly work? If we imagine a gene that codes for the purple color of kernels shown here in blue, but this gene is interrupted by a transposon shown in red, this is in, in effect, it's, a, it's an insertion mutation that knocks out the gene and prevents the color from being made, giving rise to colorless regions of, of the kernel. But the transposon itself codes for an enzyme called transposase, which acts on the transposon itself, cutting it out and moving it to a different spot in the genome. And when this happens, the kernel color gene is actually reestablished, and that section of the kernel is purple. So, Transposons in, in the plant world can give rise to all kinds of variations, such as flowers or leaf color. Uh, but what does this actually have to do with bacterial genetic variation? 
Well, it has been shown that bacteria have transposons as well. And wherever there are transposons hopping around the genome, there is opportunity for phenotypic change, including the increasingly frightening prospect of antibiotic resistance. So these genes are moved around by transposons quite frequently. And that is, is becoming a real problem. And in case you were wondering whether or not transposons exist in humans, well, wonder no longer. They are there big time. So in fact, it's been shown that uh, up to 50, almost 50% of your DNA is made up of transposons, and you compare that to only 2% that code for, for actual proteins. So no, bacteria do not have the luxury of using meiosis to generate genetic variation. But with transformation, conjugation, transduction, and transposition, they get the job done just fine. Thanks for watching.